Hi everyone and welcome to week two for Introduction to Data. This week we're going to be talking about how to think about and use data. Data. What's the point? So, data can be used to make choices about what we're going to do. It can also be used to look back at some of the choices that we've made previously and see if they're good ones or bad ones. So one of the examples that I'll use here is budgets. So you can create a budget based off of previous data that you've collected, which is how much you've spent on things. If I just walked up to a random person and said, what's a reasonable grocery budget? They wouldn't necessarily be able to answer. The way that we're able to, for example, make a grocery budget, um, and if anybody has never had to do this, just so that you know, uh, a grocery budget is where you're basically deciding how much you're going to be spending on food this week. Most people will have a grocery budget and then separate out an eating out budget if they have one. We're just simplifying with this is how much money you can spend on food in a week. Um, so a grocery budget is going to be based off of both how much money you've spent in a week previously and also how much money you are currently bringing in. For example, if you are bringing in a thousand dollars a month and you know you have groceries and rent and bills, you probably are not going to be spending five hundred dollars a week on groceries because you will number one run out of money for, and have none Number two, you won't have money for anything else. So if you know you're bringing in, let's say, a thousand dollars a month, then you have to know what money you have left. So, uh, and yes, I know that this is unreasonable. Nobody is bringing in a thousand dollars a month and being able to pay rent. There is no rent in the New England area for that. I just, it's an easy number to work with. Um, so if you have $1,000 coming in, you have $500 that you have to pay in rent, you have $100 that you have to pay in other bills, and then you have $400 that are left, you know that there's approximately four weeks in a month, so you can spend about $100 a week on groceries. Now, obviously that's an absolutely ridiculous estimate because most people are not gonna be spending the same on groceries as they do on rent, but the idea is still, that's the maximum that I can do. Then I can look back at my previous grocery bills and be able to figure out how much I have left over. The more data that I have, the more months of previous grocery bills I can look at, the better I can make my budget so that I can make guesses about what, for most of us, would need to be trimmed. For example, uh, maybe I've got $50 a week in grocery budget and I happen to know that $50 a week at a grocery store in the current day and age is going to buy me almost nothing. So um, I would know that I need to make some changes to my budget and do things like shop on Thursday mornings because that's when I know day old produce is coming out or visit farmers markets at the end of the day so that I can negotiate for some cheaper fruits and veg, stuff like that. So the more data that we have, the better we can make our choices. The better our data, the more accurate our predictions can be. So if I had exactly $50, that's a different thing than if I have $42. $42 is around $50, but it is not the same as $50. And anybody who has ever had to do grocery budgeting um, can, I think, agree with me there that they are not the same thing. Now, how to think about data. We gather data in a whole bunch of different ways. Data is going to be used in a whole bunch of different applications. And we can gather a whole bunch of different types of data. We can organize our data in different ways. We can save it in different ways. And sometimes we're going to collect our data well. You know, um, for grocery budgets, we're going to collect it well by looking at the amount of money that we have spent, um, you know, down to the penny on groceries for the week. But if we didn't know what we were doing, maybe we'd look at our grocery budget and say, you know, how many bananas and avocados did we buy this week? 
we could certainly collect that data, but it might not be the most valuable data. One of the things that we need to look at with the data that we're collecting is our data discrete or continuous. Is the data points on a graph or is it a line on a graph? And then we have to think about how our data is organized. There are some ways that we can look at data and organize it, and I think we can all agree it makes sense. Um, there are some ways that are going to sound very silly, and there are some that are going to be gray area. For example, if I have um, a budget and I am looking at the amount of money that I'm spending on groceries, bills, and let's say rent, and then I'm looking at the amount of money that I'm bringing in from my job, I'm likely to want to split those two out, and I'm likely to want to split out my budgets more carefully. What I would probably not want to do is have a column called money and just put all of the numbers sort of higgledy-piggledy in there. We can look at the previous example of books. Maybe we could organize our books by genre or trope or recommended age range. Maybe we could look at our textbooks and by the type of course that it's for or the department that it's for or the level that it is. Is it an undergraduate or a graduate textbook? There's all kinds of different ways that we can go about organizing our data. Some that will make sense and some that won't. Data and problem solving. So when we are collecting data, the point is to be able to then hopefully make some good decisions after we figure out the information that we are getting from our data. We have to de define the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, you know, in the case of, I, I keep using budgets because I think it's something that everybody has had to do at least at once in their lives. Um, but if the problem is, how do I make myself a budget? Then I can outline the process that I'm going to have for making my budget. I'm going to define a success. In this case, a success is if I have more money coming in than going out. Um, I need to collect and structure my data, organize it. I may want to visualize and analyze my data. Maybe I want to make um, some variety of graph or chart with how much money is coming in and how much is going out so that I can visually inspect in an easier way what I'm spending on things. And then I can figure out how the data is going to change what I'm doing going forward. You know, if I'm collecting the amount of money that I'm spending on groceries every week, and then I'm making some changes to what's going on, then I would want to then look back and say, you know, are these changes working? Am I able to make sure that I have more money coming in than going out now? If not, what do I need to do next? So that's kind of how we end up doing that. Now, when we're collecting our data, we can collect data manually or automatically. You know, for example, um, I could write down every purchase that I make, and I could write down every paycheck that I get. I could do this automatically. I could, uh, a lot of credit cards will actually give you the ability to download a previous month or previous year spending. Some will even break it out for you so that you can see where your money is going. Um, another example is taking temperatures. Um, you know, maybe you are going outside and you're taking the temperature every hour of a day and that's how you're figuring out what the, you know, average temperature of the day is. Maybe you're doing it automatically and you have a sensor set up and that's sending the data somewhere. When the data is being collected, it's important to pay attention to the form that it's coming in. So, for example, is this dollars, is this pounds, is this sterling? Um, if it's a temperature, is it Celsius or Fahrenheit? They're not the same. Um, if you are measuring something, is it meters or is it feet? Is it, you know, imperial or metric? So, it's important that you think about the type of data that you are collecting, but also paying attention to the format that your data is in. If I, again, just give you the number four, 
that's not that useful. If I say it's four degrees Fahrenheit, that's not the same as four degrees Celsius. And that's not even in the same ballpark as this piece of wood is four feet long or four meters long. You know, those are very, very different things that we're talking about. So it's important that we're paying attention to the form, the organization, and also the accuracy. Um, you know, data accuracy is actually a huge problem. You have to make sure that you're measuring your data all in the same way. For example, if you've ever built something and you're using a ruler, are you starting at the end of the ruler or are you starting at the marking that's indicating where the first sort of measurement should be taken? Some rulers have the marking being the edge, some don't. Um, you know, if you're going to be doing temperatures, are you keeping track of partial degrees? Are you rounding in any way? Are you rounding up? Are you rounding down? How are you deciding that? And it's really important that whenever you are measuring your data, everybody that's on the team is measuring it in the same way. It is also important that you write down how your data is being measured because even if you are the only person on the team and your team is one, um, it's still possible to forget how you're measuring your data. Uh, I don't know if anybody else does like sewing or crocheting or knitting, but like that's where one of the things that can happen is you'll measure something and then you'll forget how you measured it. You know, well, where did you mark the waist? Well, where did you mark the, you know, how long the skirt or pants is supposed to be? Um, where are you marking how long the sweater is supposed to be? Like, all of those things make a difference. Structuring your data is making sure that it's organized, labeled, and we're specifying the type of data that's expected in a lot of cases. We wanna make sure that we are structuring our data or organizing our data so that we don't have any confusion when we're looking at it. Let's say we have a spreadsheet of data, rows versus columns, is important. Are you putting something into the right row? Are you putting it into the right column? You have to make sure each row and column is clearly labeled. You can't just, you know, switch them up. And then you may want to think about what type of data is expected. You know, for example, if I'm saying, please rate your customer service experience at your last meal on a scale of one to 10, and you tell me, very good, I'm going to know something's up because that's not in the scale of 1 to 10. Or if I said I need to collect, you know, names and email addresses and you said 123 Main Street, that is unlikely to be a name or an email address. So it's important that we are careful when we are collecting our data that we are specific about the type of data how the data is organized, and that we are placing the data that we've collected in the right spot. Analyzing the data is basically where we process it. We can define or clean our data. Uh, data cleaning is actually a relatively big topic. Data analysis, you, you can do it to see trends if it's a very small amount of data, however, well, it is true that small amounts of data are a great way to start practicing so that you can also do a check to make sure that any of the ways that you're looking at the data and analyzing the data is correct. Most likely, the data sets that we would be looking at in the real world are huge. Most of the data sets require large computer programs and some variety of AI, artificial intelligence, or ML, machine learning. And those data sets will be millions or hundreds of millions of lines, multiple gigabytes of data, not something a human could go through. Uh, a human can go through 10, 20, maybe 30, 50 lines of data semi-reasonably, but frankly, they're not gonna be amazing at it and they're probably not gonna be able to do that much with it. You know, if I just handed you 50 numbers, would you be able to tell me what the trends are? Probably not. Um, the type of analysis that we do depends on the data. We might do statistical analysis um, and we might be looking at trends like 
when are books being borrowed? When are books not being borrowed? We could do text analysis where we are looking at how satisfied people are with books. Maybe people are more satisfied with books in January because they like sitting inside with a book while it's snowing and it feels cozy. Maybe people are less satisfied with books in July because they don't like the feeling of the pages with humidity. So the type of data that we have is likely to influence the type of analysis that we are doing. Visualizing our data is where we are taking the data that we've collected and in the process of turning it into information and processing it, we are finding basically a pretty way to show our data to someone else. Giving somebody raw data, which is basically like a raw spreadsheet or a raw database or something and it's just you know numbers and numbers and numbers that's unlikely to sway somebody if you're trying to convince somebody to spend more money on ads giving them a huge spreadsheet of numbers is unlikely to do it if however you give them a pie chart or a bar graph or something along those lines, it's a lot easier to convince people what's going on because people like pictures to go with their data. Data visualization is very important so that when you are showing your data to other people, they're able to follow what's going on. Data visualizations, however, can show anything. Data can be manipulated in a variety of ways, some good, some not good. Data visualizations can be good or bad, confusing or clear, and this will all be based off of the choices that you're making. We're going to talk more about data visualizations a little bit later, but everything from the size of the visualization to the measurements that you've chosen to the colors that have been chosen will end up affecting how good your data visualization is. Those data visualizations can also end up influencing whether people agree with you or not. For most people, just giving them raw data is not going to be the right choice. Now, some examples. Um, I also included a website that has some other examples. So we can see looking at one of these, um, mostly these graphs make no sense. So if we have a bar graph that says 20% earn more, 130,000, median 105,000, 25% earn less, 85,000. But like if you look at the actual bars and the size, it doesn't really sort of correspond to anything. And what, what information can you get out of that? There's a median in salary? Sure, I guess. But what does that mean? How many people did they check? What's the profession? Like that, that means nothing. Um, another example of a poorly done visualization. We can see that the Saturday, Saturday's result vote, 10% of people said yes, 90% of people said no. However, when you look at the lovely little circle, the 10% that said yes, looks like it's actually three quarters of the circle. The 90% that said no is the tinier piece of the circle. So if you were just giving this sort of a quick look, you would probably think that the no's were the smaller set. Um, I also included the shoe color frequency as a bad example because it honestly just really annoyed me that they didn't have the bars matching the shoe colors. Like I get why you wouldn't want to have white being one of the bars on a white background. Like that's not the issue. But literally none of them match and that just kind of annoys me. Okay. Now, deciding how your data can inform what you do next. What's your goal? So part of collecting this data and trying to process this data, what do you want to do with it? So once you've gathered it, are you gathering it yearly, monthly, daily? What makes sense for the goal that you have? Let's say, for example, we're looking at the library. Well, if we want to look at how many books are being borrowed, 
daily check-ins of how many books are being borrowed and we check in daily for six months or a year probably makes a lot more sense because there might be trends happening over a year that we wouldn't necessarily notice otherwise that I could see being very cyclical. However, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is no yearly trend. Maybe it's a monthly trend. I don't know till I've gathered the data. Um, maybe I own a store and I need to look at what's the average hours my employees are working. Do I need more employees on call? Do I need to have different types of stock? Am I running out of stock? You know, if you look at a grocery store, they are very careful about what they have in stock. They can't afford for food to go bad. So they will have stock being ordered and stock being delivered. They'll have days for this. And they're going to keep close track of what's being sold, when it's being sold. And they'll have the sort of general weekly what's being sold. Um, you know, if you happen to live in New England, you know that Sundays are the most popular day to go to the grocery store. For a lot of us, it's Market Basket. Um, and the joy that is Market Basket on a Sunday. Whereas, like, you would also know that if we have a snowstorm, the day before the snowstorm, is also going to be the same joy, but even more so. Um, and so we would be able to maybe make changes to the stock that we're ordering based off of things like the weather. Um, and that wouldn't necessarily correspond to, oh, well, last week we went through 20 loaves of bread. This week we went through 40 loaves of bread. Um, but we would be able to make some choices about how much bread we should order going forward. Data can be descriptive or predictive. So descriptive data is data might show anomalies or past trends, can be used to generate reports, and it can be sort of used basically to describe something. Um, so we might be able to look at previous behaviors and we could start looking to see if there's correlations or causations. Predictive data is looking at what's happened in the past and then trying to use that to decide what's going to happen in the future. So we can, for example, make guesses. What are market trends going to be? Uh, what do we think stock should be, you know, what do we predict stock we should have next month, next year, next holiday, that kind of thing. Data can be used every day, both for businesses and for just sort of regular people. Businesses will use data to make decisions, everything from what's being stocked, what's being ordered, what needs to be pre-ordered, what's selling well, what's not selling well. And that's if we're talking about businesses that are, you know, uh, business to customer or business to business, they are still paying attention to, you know, what those trends are. Humans will also use this data. If you have kids um, and your kids eat grilled cheese twice a week, then you can take that data and turn it into the information of how much bread you need to buy. Um, if previous holiday seasons you spent $200 on presents, you can guess that you're probably going to spend at least that on presents this year. That's the kind of data and information that you might not necessarily think about, but actually does affect all of us every single day. So that's the end of week two on data. I hope that was interesting and informative, and I hope you all have a lovely day.